Let's go to the book of Acts. I'll ask you to put your finger in your Bible or your, your smart device to the last chapter in Acts chapter 28. The book of Acts chronicles the expanse of Christianity as the Holy Spirit moved through the apostles and the gospel continued from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the world world and it was not hindered. The same gospel that was taught and was preached and that changed hearts and minds then is the same gospel today. So we are taking cues from the early apostles and church planters and pastors and, and, and like Paul, how do we do the same thing? How do we take the message of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, the righteousness that he adorns us with being adopted into his family. How do we take that to our culture today? So let's uh, finish up in uh, this um, study of the amazing acts of the apostles and the power of the Holy Spirit through the gospel. In Acts 28, we'll start in verse 14 and read through the end of the chapter. And so we, Paul and his entourage, came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case." But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and to speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, hmm, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we, we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to Paul at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes, for their eyes they have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart in turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Paul lived there two whole years at his expense, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. This is God's word. Last year at this time, the number one trending topic was after eight seasons, how will Game of Thrones end? Times certainly have changed. That is not the trending topic now, is it? But back then, a year ago, 12 months, how would the war against the Night King turn out? 
Who would ascend to the throne of Westeros? Would it be a king? Would it be a queen? Needless to say, um, not everybody was satisfied with the ending of Game of Thrones, while others accepted it. You see, the conclusion of a film or a book or the final episode of a long-running television series always creates a stir. What kind of endings of a film or book do you like? Personally, I like the I didn't see it coming gotcha endings. Perhaps you like happily ever after endings. Do you want complete closure or are you okay with unrequited love? Today, shows seem to drag out uh, multiple episodes coming uh, to a conclusion. Some movies even allow you to choose your own ending. If you favor complete closure, then the ending of Acts will leave you wanting. Luke has taken us for quite a journey. His writing is remarkable, but the ending might seem surprising and perhaps a bit frustrating. We've been leading up to this big trial. Paul is going to go on trial uh, uh, with Caesar himself, but nothing is said about it at the conclusion. And we end without even knowing what happened to Paul. Did he die? Did he live? Did he go on church planning? Did he make it to Spain? I mean, can you imagine reading a novel with an ending like this? You would want to contact the, the, the author and say, hey, I'm missing chapter 29. I need to know what happened to Paul. In a sense, all we have at the end of Acts is a to-be-continued ending. Why the silence? I'm going to answer that after I wipe my nose because allergies are killing me, y'all. The end of this book. Well, we must remember one overarching truth. Luke didn't set out in the book of Acts to write a biography of just Paul. Luke purposed to describe the acts of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. His thesis was to describe the unstoppable progress of the gospel. That's the subject, not Paul. The good news of Jesus Christ working powerfully powerfully through the Holy Spirit, that's the subject. In his Luke's first book, The Gospel of Luke, he set out to describe all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. That's how he starts the book of Acts, telling us how he told us all of that in the Gospel of Luke. The book of Acts, then, is about all that Jesus continued to do through the paraclete, the comforter, the one called alongside Christians after Jesus ascended to heaven. So Luke leaves us with Paul preaching the mighty gospel of the kingdom in Rome. And so the king, Jesus, and his good news is really the hero of Acts. It's not Paul or anyone else. And Luke concludes Acts on a note of victory. There's a triumph of King Jesus, and and this is a fitting conclusion. Now, in addition, we must also consider a practical application of Luke's ending. Luke's message ends up being something like this. The book is finished, but the mission isn't. Christians get to enter into this story. We're invited into this ongoing mission. We get to participate in the next chapters of Acts. We get to join the drama of spreading the good news to the nations. God replaces the messengers, but the message and the mission 
are unchanging until King Jesus returns. So let's jump into our text today by recounting a, a greater context. Let's zoom out and then let's zoom in. Okay, that might have been a bad choice of words. I know some of you are tired of Zoom, but hang in there with me. Rome was a big deal to Paul. Rome was a big deal to the world. It was the, the largest and greatest city in the, in the Western world at the time. And Paul wanted to go to Rome. He said in chapter 19, I must visit Rome. But Jesus had also told him in chapter 20, 23, you must testify in Rome. Paul wanted to go to Rome. Jesus wanted Paul to go to Rome. So if God promised this, then it would be safe to believe that it would occur. We just don't know how it would happen. And so Luke tells us the story of how against all odds and obstacles, what seemed to be impossible became possible. Paul had expressed his intention to go directly from Jerusalem to Rome, but instead, what happened? He was arrested in Jerusalem. He was subjected to endless trials. He was imprisoned again in Caesarea. He was threatened with assassination uh, by the Jews and then nearly drowned to death in the Mediterranean um, off the island of Malta. He was almost killed by soldiers and then he was poisoned by a snake on this island. Each incident seemed to be designed to prevent him from reaching his God-planned, God-promised destination to carry and fulfill his God-calling. And it wasn't just the forces of nature, water and wind and, and snakes, or the hindrances of human beings, schemes and plots and threats, which came against Paul. I think we must add something else to this equation. Spiritual warfare. Quite frankly, Satan does not want Paul to succeed because Paul's success means that the gospel goes forth and it transforms hearts and lives. It transforms relationships and marriages. It changes cities and cultures. And the scripture is full of examples of the devil seeking to thwart God's plan and God's people. He tried through Pharaoh to drown the infant Moses through Haman to annihilate the Jews, through Herod to destroy the baby Jesus, and through the Jewish religious leaders to stifle the apostolic witness and to smother the church at its birth. Will the gospel be hindered? Will the gospel be prevented from reaching Rome? No, Luke tells us. Paul incredibly and miraculously reaches Rome. And there, even when he gets there, potential hindrances of the gospel arise again. Paul is placed under arrest and jailed with the Roman guard assigned to him 24-7. What does Paul do? Does he quit? Does he lay down? Does he resign out of frustration and fatigue? Does he spend all of his time preparing his case for Pharaoh and laying out all his defense when he will appear in court? Absolutely not. What does he do? He gets busy and he does what he's always been doing. He preaches the gospel and he teaches the truth of God through the scripture. He's undeterred from his mission, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul does not allow discomfort and discouragement to keep him from fulfilling his calling. He actually leverages his negative circumstances for the better. And as we think deeply about this, we find that Paul's ministry was actually authenticated by his sufferings. You see, friends, nothing proves the sincerity of our beliefs 
like our willingness to suffer for them. And Paul was living proof that the authentic life of a Christian is one that follows the life pattern of our suffering servant, Christ himself. I've seen this happen many times with church plants, for example. A multiplicity of crazy and hard circumstances as they're trying to get off the the ground or as they're just getting traction uh, in their community. It happens so regularly with church plants that it can't be a coincidence. It has to be spiritual warfare. Satan does not want the gospel to gain a new foothold in any community. It happened with us. In the first year of Walnut Creek's planting, every core team family was hit with a major crisis, a lacerated kidney, a marital affair, death of a parent, serious infection and illness, a job transfer. transfer. It would have been easy to wave the white flag and surrender, but by God's grace, we didn't, and the gospel was not hindered. As Grace Central was starting, the attack came directly to the church planter's family, the Blosser family, and and they were hit with tremendous uh, and life-altering physical ailments. Was the gospel hindered? No, because God's grace was sufficient for them, for His power was perfected through their Weakness, how appropriate that their name is Grace Central. Hope Presbyterian Church in Grandview was about to get going when Joe and Josie Hack had a premature birth. Instead of gathering people and making plans, they found themselves having to spend all of their time in the NICU. But here's the God thing. Some doctors and nurses they met while in the hospital actually joined their church plant. Folks, they would have never met unless they had experienced that hardship. Our dear friends and daughter church plant story press in Westerville, they're going through the ringer right now. Amy had a cancerous tumor removed. The young man who leads their worship was recently diagnosed with lung cancer. Peter had serious surgery. They are under attack. The evil one does not want them to be fruitful. He wants them to throw in the towel and quit. Will the gospel be hindered? Absolutely not. We all know Justin and his team intimately. We know that they will continue to call upon the name of the Lord that they might be rescued. And we know that they will continually point people to Jesus because he's the only one that can redeem the stories of brokenness in everyone's lives. You see, it's in spite of these attacks It's through hard experiences, it's through all of the bad news that the good news of Jesus shines brightest and sounds most beautiful. Paul's witness while in captivity in Rome were both expanded and enriched in two ways. Nope, those are the two ways in those two years that he was there. Even though he was chained, the word of God was not. Even though his hand was bound, his mouth was open for Jesus. Paul doesn't complain, he proclaims. And since his imprisonment fortunately was more like a guarded house arrest, a constant flow of people were able to visit him. And he makes the most of the situation by even ministering to the, the Roman imperial guard and by extension those who are associated with the guards. And he ministers to the Jews and eventually all who would come to greet him. In the book of Philippians, which was written during this imprisonment, Paul mentions how the whole palace guard was hearing the good news. 
and how God was accomplishing his purposes through his imprisonment. He says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and all, to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. We learn in the New Testament book of Philemon that a runaway slave in Rome named Onesimus embraced the gospel upon hearing it from Paul in Rome. You see, Paul's witness was expanded even though he was imprisoned. The gospel was unhindered. During those two years, Paul's witness was enriched as he wrote the prison epistles or letters, the letters to the Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians during that time. As he awaited trial and even possible execution, Paul knew in a very visceral and powerful way that the supreme authority to whom he bowed and bended the knee was not the Lord Caesar, but the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as he wrote to other Christians in other cities, those whom he had visited and planted churches, he clearly and powerfully penned the supreme, sovereign, undisputed, and unrivaled lordship of Jesus Christ. God created all things through Jesus Christ and has reconciled all things through Jesus Christ. And the fullness of the Godhead, which dwells in Jesus, also worked through him. Christ is both the agent of creation and redemption. And Paul was able to eloquently uh, write about that in his letters. As Paul's perspective was adjusted, his horizon extended, his vision was clarified, and his witness was expanded by his prison experience. And so... As we come to the conclusion of Luke's historical account of the Acts of the Apostles, of how people uh, redeemed by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit shared the good news, the gospel from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the world, how people's lives were transformed by the the death of Jesus and his resurrection, how, how new churches uh, of people put away their differences in race and class and education and socioeconomics and, 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 and power to form new communities where the gospel was the main thing. As we come to the end of this book and we see how Christians formed new societies based on love and forgiveness based on grace and mercy, based on kindness and joy, things very different than the world bases its life on. We see that it was unhindered. The gospel went out. It had many, multiple times that it could have died. But God's plan was not thwarted. It continued and unfortunately, we as don't get the rest of Paul's story here. There's no Acts chapter 29. I, I kind of sort of believe that Luke ended his historical count this way intentionally. And while the, the missionary endeavors of Paul and his associates seem to dominate the, the last half of the book, uh, the narrative of Acts... Remember, they were still not the focus or the subject of, of Luke's uh, book. Luke's focus was the expansion of the gospel. How God's message of hope and healing, of forgiveness and redemption, of restoration and wholeness was indeed good news for those who embraced it by faith. So the book is finished, but the mission is not. That's why I love the ending, the very last verse, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness 
and without hindrance. Yes, Luke's describing what Paul did in those two years of imprisonment at Rome, but it's also what he's inspiring all of his readers to do. It's what he's inspiring and saying, here are your marching orders now to proclaim the kingdom of God and to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and all hindrance. Let's pray. Lord, it seems easy um, to shrink back and to say, you know, there are better spokespersons of the gospel than me. You know, Paul, he was an amazing person. He was eloquent. He was educated. Uh, and he was a bit type A. That's easy for him to do. It's not easy for me. But even then, Paul continually prayed for boldness, that he should proclaim the gospel as he should. As bold as he was, as strong a personality as was, as educated and, 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 and as eloquent as he was, he still had issues with it. He did not want to be rejected. He didn't want Christ to be rejected. He didn't want to be embarrassed. He didn't want to be tortured. He didn't want to be persecuted. But yet he wanted to continue to share the gospel. Paul didn't pray for opportunities. He prayed for boldness. Lord, we're not praying for more opportunities. We have ample opportunities around us. We're going to pray for boldness. Help us to go outside of our comfort zone to tell people about our friend Jesus and what a great friend he is. Help us to tell others by word and deed how much we believe that Jesus loves them and that we want them to believe that Jesus loves them as well. We don't want to be the stopping gap, the hindrance of the gospel that we know that you will work in and through us as a conduit of Jesus' love and grace, his message uh, of forgiveness, his message of righteousness that can be applied to our account. Lord, may we continue that mission. This book is ended. The mission is not. We are your messengers. We are your ambassadors. And help us through the path, same power of the Holy Spirit that was demonstrated time and time again in Acts. May that same power come upon us as we share the good news. In your name we pray. And with faith, because he who promised is faithful. Amen. Amen. Let's together proclaim our faith in the unhindered gospel with this question and answer from the New City Catechism. How can we be saved? Only by faith in Jesus Christ and in his atoning death on the cross. So even though we are guilty of having disobeyed God and are still inclined to all evil, nevertheless, God, without any merit of our own, but only by pure grace, imputes to us the perfect righteousness of Christ when we repent and believe in him.